Hello and welcome to this uh, presentation about migrating your application to SDK3. So, in this talk, we are focusing on SDK3 in general, um, but also especially if you are already using one of our previous generation SDKs, how to migrate from what we call SDK2, the older current generation from SDK2 to SDK3. Even if you are not using SDK2 currently, uh, you'll still get plenty of information about what is new in SDK3, what has changed, how you use it, etc. My name is uh, Michael Nitschinger. I'm part of the um, SDK team. I've worked on both uh, SDK2 and SDK3, mostly on the Java side. So this is why you see many of the examples in Java in this presentation, but don't worry, most of them are kept very simple. So even if Java isn't your favorite language, you'll still be able to take a lot of information from this presentation. So what are we going to cover today? Um, first, we'll talk a little bit about the motivation, why we did SDK3 in the first place. Then we'll talk about SDK3 from an overview perspective. Then we'll talk about general concerns you want to consider when uh, you're migrating your application from SDK2 to SDK3. Then we'll close out with language specifics, so certain things that have changed in Node, Java, etc., um, that you might want to know about. And then we'll close out with a Q&A session. Okay, let's jump straight in. <coughs> now, first, let's talk about the motivation, why we did this thing called SDK3 uh, in the first place. Now, um, let's do a little bit uh, of a history tour. When going back all the way to 2010, 2011, um, Couchbase was still called Membase and was at that time very heavily based around the Memcached ecosystem. So the very first generation of our SDKs were actually not SDKs maintained by Couchbase to a degree. Um, they were heavily based on community memcached clients. So for example, in Java, spy memcached, um, which was great at the time because uh, the early product could benefit from the vast community that was out there around memcached. But as the system added features over time, it became clear that just relying on the memcached clients doesn't really cut it. So the first generation of SDKs was introduced around uh, 2011, 2012. Um, with, with Membase 1.6 up to Couchbase Server 2.0, and it added the view capability to the key value memcached support. As the product grew even larger, uh, query nickel was on the horizon, we decided we need to rework our clients um, to give all those services a really good um, API to use. So that's what, when SDK2 uh, came on the scene, right around Couchbase Server 3.0 in December 2014. All, uh, taking you all the way up to 2020, so six years, we carried SDK2 around. Uh, and we'll still do, of course, because we maintain it. But over those six years, we added more features, uh, full text search, analytics capabilities, all those things to the client. And that's why, for example, Java is right now in 2.7, right? It became clear over the last one and a half, two years that new features like collections and scopes will be added to the server at some point. And we took a step back and said, okay, can we fold this new um, API on top of the old clients or is it better if we develop a new one? Now, considering more points, right, more things that happened around the same time, we decided we need to go forward with a new major version um, of the SDKs to really give you the best experience uh, going forward. So what were the main motivations behind developing it? The first one was resyncing with the state of the art. So in some languages, certain patterns and APIs changed. And of course, we want to make sure that the SDKs follow that. In some cases, it means also breaking the APIs. Simplifying the surface area. Over time, the SDKs grew and we, in API size, and now we can take the opportunity to shrink it back down, make it easier to discover. Also fixing long-standing bugs and removing old and deprecated APIs that we couldn't do because we follow semantic versioning, adding new platforms, and also preparing for future server releases. 
So let's drill into each of those individually a little bit. Resyncing with the state of the art. For example, in Node.js, uh, the, the language itself seldom promises. So in SDK 3, uh, the Node SDK now follows uh, that standard and uses uh, promises as a first class concept. On the Java side, we moved from Rx Java to Reactor for many different reasons, uh, performance reasons, native Java 8 support, a bigger community around it. And there were other changes that we had to make which would have broken the API in any, any case. So we decided to make some adjustments there as well. On uh, the .NET side, we moved to .NET Standard 2.0, uh, requiring a, a new framework version, supporting um, core, .NET Core, etc. In Python 3, we clean things up, we support Python 3 type annotations, so Python 3 is a big topic here as well. What do I mean by simplifying uh, and consolidating the surface area? Well, if you look at um, Java SDK 2.7, for example, but .NET is a very similar story, the API surface grew over time. So we started with, here we have upset as an example. We started with uh, the document itself and the timeout. And then we added the old durability requirements, persist to and replicate to. And to really support all of the options with combinatorial explosion, the APIs grew. In SDK3, we took a step back and said, okay, how can we consolidate that while still allowing to add us more stuff in the future? Now, all SDK3 APIs take the mandatory arguments first and then take an option class, which is optional, at the end, which will leave us with exactly two overloads per method in Java, for example, right? So one here upset only takes the document ID and the content, and then there are upset options, which take persist to replicate to timeouts and some of the newer things that we added that we'll talk about in a bit. So very much cleaned up API going into SDK 3 from 2.7, just with this alone and the other things, as you'll see. Also, we are fixing long setting bugs and removing old API. Because we are following semantic versioning, we can't just remove stuff. We can only deprecate it and add it, but we can never remove it. So with SDK3, we can take the opportunity to clean it up there as well. As with um, Java, for example, in .NET, we went from 800 plus overloads uh, to just a couple dozen. Right? So that's, that's a big deal. Um, we also changed how you interact with content and transcoders and serializers. So we cleaned up some of the confusions that our users had with the SDK2 API. And then some SDKs like Java required type changes. So there is the year uh, 2038 problem where the, basically the clock wraps over and we used an integer type, which in Java is a signed one and not an unsigned one. So we ran into issues there and we took the opportunity to clean it up as well. Great news, we also added two new platforms, Scala 1.0 and Ruby 3.0. Um, Ruby is 3.0 because we had the Ruby SDK before, then we moved it to a community maintained SDK. And now because we have more demand from users and the community, we decided to bring it back as an officially supported SDK. We are also working on Kotlin support and we have a community supported Rust SDK, which is currently in 1.0 Alpha. So let's talk about SDK 3 from an overview perspective. One big change that you'll see when you go from SDK 2 to 3 is that operations moved um, inside the SDK. While in SDK 2, most of the API was inside the bucket level, because that's where it grew from. In SDK3, we moved it around. So at the cluster level now, you'll find the query, nickel queries, search, full text search, and analytics APIs, as well as certain management APIs. At the bucket level, you'll still have view queries because they belong to the bucket level. And then all the key value access has been moved into the collection scope. Also, sorry, at the collection level. And then between buckets and collections, you have scopes which we'll talk about in a second, but it is also going to be possible to perform um, analytics queries and nickel queries at the scope level as well. One cool feature we added to SDK3 is what we call transparent projections. So 
<coughs> if you've worked with subdocument API and SDK2, you know that basically you work with it on a row by row basis, right? So, so you, you define your specs and then you get your results. Now, while it is very efficient to work with it, it's not very convenient if you just want to project certain fields out of a document and get the results back. So that's why in SDK3, we added the project option to the get option. So the get operation allows you to specify a list of fields and the SDK will use sub document underneath internally and then project it back into a JSON object. So here in this case, we are loading an airport from our travel sample data set. And we only want to project the airport name, the country and the geolocation, which is itself an, a JSON object. Now, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that the content actually looks like a full JSON object, but only with the airport name, the geolocation and the country as its fields with the content. So you can use that for both high level abstractions. So you can use it for object document mapping, or if you just want to work with the subset of the data, because it's more efficient, right? If let's say your document has three megabytes and all you need is a couple of fields to assemble a subset of your entity, you can use the project method to very efficiently only fetch those fields. You don't have to transfer everything over the network and, and just use the fields. And the resulting content looks like as it was just those couple of fields in the first place. Another feature that has been added to Couchbase Server 6.5 um, is called synchronous replication. And the big difference between synchronous replication and our old durability requirements, persist to and replicate to, which are by the way still present in SDK3, is there is no client side poly needed. The way persist to and replicate to worked was that we would issue to the SDK, we would issue an operation. And when we get a successful response from the server, we would then start polling the active and the replicas until a certain state is reached that tells us uh, it performed successfully, or we get an error, times out, et cetera. Now with synchronous replication, all that logic is moved to the server side and it abstracts the cluster topology from the durability requirements, which is a big deal because with replicate to and persist to, you would have to say something like persist to two or replicate to one, which implies a certain cluster topology configuration. Now with synchronous replication, you define the semantics you want. So you say, make sure the durability level is majority, which will make sure it is replicated to majority of the active and replicas. Majority and persist to active is similar, but it makes sure that in addition to replicating to majority of the replicas, it will also persist it on the active node. And then with persist to majority, it will make sure that the majority of the replicas have the operation persisted on disk before uh, returning a successful result. So this is clearly a step forward with regards to ease of use and efficiency when it comes to uh, synchronous replication. A big feature that has been added to 6.5 and 6.6 in developer preview are collections and scopes. And this is probably the feature you'll see most when you start working with SDK3. And the reason is we had to prepare the SDK now so that when um, the server ships that supports collections as a uh, general availability, we're already set and you can go and use it from day one. So if you, ju just a, a warning here, if you enable developer preview mode on 6.5 and 6.6, it is not an officially supported configuration, right? So you, you shouldn't enable it in production systems, but we really encourage you to try it out in development and staging systems and give us feedback and see if there are any issues, et cetera. So what are collections and scopes? So a collection is a data container, right? If you're coming from a relational database, think tables, right? So you can have users, airports, whatever, and they group together documents. The big difference is to tables is that each document inside your collection, very much like it was in SDK2 at the bucket level, every document can look different, right? So there is no schema we enforce there's likely an implicit scheme that you have in your application, but we don't enforce it, which gives you flexibility in what you put in your documents and how they work. If you're using CouchBase Server 6.5 and 6.6 and earlier without developer preview mode enabled, all you have to do is open the default collection, which is available on the bucket, 
and it will just work, right? So it will assume the default collection is basically your bucket and you can perform all key value operations on that collection. The SDK will handle all the backwards compatible stuff. And the cool thing about it is once you go to, SD, uh, to, to the server release that will support collections fully, all you have to do is adjust the, the name of the collection and the scope you're opening and you're all set. You don't even have to change your application. So what are scopes used for? Scopes group collections and they're usually used for multi-tenancy, right? So you can have an arbitrary number of collections inside a scope and you can have multiple scopes even with the same collections underneath. So for example, if you deploy your same application to multiple locations in, in your organization or with different customers, but you still want to use the same database, you can have one scope for each customer and then underneath you have the same collections and then when you start up your application all you do is you open a scope with that specific customer name and then you work in your um, scoped collection list basically without having to change anything else but of course you can still access other scopes other collections and even perform queries that go across scopes and collections if you want to do that so how do we connect, right? So every, the, your first introduction into the SDK is going to be the connect method at the cluster level. So usually when you use regular username and password, you use the connect method, you give it the list of host names, the connection string, and then the username and the password. That's one way to authenticate. And the other one is certificate authentication. So you can connect to the cluster via certificate authenticator giving it the key certificate chain etc usually you'll start out with um, just regular username and password but certificate authentication is definitely a, a viable choice out there note that this is different from having LDAP enabled on the server side you would still let's say use a username and password uh, but then you have to make a couple adjustments uh, to use some some uh, SESL authentication mechanism that is compatible with LDAP this is you'll find everything in our documentation if you want to learn more about it. Now, if you want to disconnect from your cluster, you call the disconnect method, which will implicitly terminate all open bucket connections as well. So how does a nickel query look like in practice? So as I mentioned, query has been moved to the cluster level. So you perform cluster.query, and this is a pattern you'll see across the SDK. You'll have your required parameters, and then you'll have options, which are optional, and all the operations return some kind of result. In this case, our query operation takes a mandatory statement. Then we can supply options here. In this case, we use prepared statements. So we set ad hoc to false, and then it returns a query result. And then we can iterate our query result, uh, print out metadata, etc. Very important, if you run a cluster that is older than 6.5, you still need to open at least one bucket. And the reason is that Couch Server 6.5 introduced the capabilities for the SDKs to grab a configuration from the cluster without, that is not scoped to a bucket, right? So keep in mind, if you're 6.5 and later, you can use cluster level queries directly. If you are pre-6.5, make sure you open one bucket. But the SDK will fail with an exception saying, um, you're using an older server, please open at least one bucket. So it will nudge you in the right direction if you forget. Analytics queries by intention were very similar. So instead of calling cluster.query, you call cluster.analytics query. Then you give it your um, analytics statement and you'll get back an analytics result. And then you can iterate your rows. Uh, you can turn them into a specific data type. You can also print out metadata um, if you want. It works very similar. At the bucket level, how do you go from cluster to bucket? Basically, you call cluster.bucket with a name. And, and this is very different from SDK2, remember, because we go all in on road based access control. We don't support a cluster that doesn't support road based access control. You provide your credentials on cluster connect, and then there is no need to call authenticate or give it a bucket password. So the whole bootstrapping process is much less error prone than it was in SDK2. Um, at, the, at the bucket level, you can perform few queries. Uh, you can you get access to the collections, and there are also management APIs available. Going one level below, um, at the collection level, 
This is the primary API for everything key value. Full document operations, sub-document sub operations. So in the screenshot here, you'll see the get operation on the collection, which fetches the document. So doc is the doc ID. And then you get back a get result. Remember, previously we had query result, analytics result, and here we get a get result. On the get result, we can access the content, we can access other metadata. And what we do here is we modify the content. Here we arbitrarily set some kind of value to true. And then we perform a replace operation. We give it the document ID, the content, and then we set replace options and we give it the cast value from the original operation. Now, people who look at this, um, there, there is a slight gotcha in here, which is why this will throw an exception. So you can see that we fetch the document with the document ID doc, but then we replace the document with a document ID called ID. And since we set the case value, this will throw a cast mismatch exception. Right? This is in general how you work with the key value API. And the reason it will throw a cast mismatch exception is because the document with doc ID will have a different case value than the document with doc. And error handling is a topic that we'll touch on very briefly, but if you want to learn more, I really recommend that you check out our documentation. We have instructions on how you perform cast mismatch retries, etc. Also with SCK3, we made sure that all primary APIs are first class JSON APIs. Now, there are certain legacy operations on the SDK which work with non-JSON data. Um, counters, uh, they were called counters in SDK2, and append and prepend. So what we did was in SDK3, we moved those APIs to the binary collection, which you can access through the um, collection instance. <clears throat> so on the collection instance, you call dot binary, you get a binary collection, and then you can perform your append, decrement, increment, and prepend operations, being very clear that those are not JSON operations. Again, we, we took the opportunity to clear up certain points of confusion that users had in the past because we had counter append and prepend on the bucket level. And then sometimes people would confuse a sub document lookup operation or sub document mutate counter with an uh, increment and decrement, which was also at the bucket level. Now they are very clearly separated and it's much easier to misuse them. We also greatly extended support for management APIs. So in SDK2, we had a cluster uh, level cluster manager and a bucket level bucket manager. Um, in SDK3, we broke it up. So at the cluster level, you can manage users, you can manage buckets, you can manage your query and analytics indexes, and you can manage your search indexes. And at the bucket level, you can manage your collections and you can manage your view indexes. They all follow a very similar pattern. There is no need to re-authenticate, no need to provide new credentials, and they all specified and work the same way across SDKs. One thing we added in SDK3 is the error context. When troubleshooting issues with support in the field with our customers, one of the, the issues in general are um, exceptions and timeouts and the associated context because just knowing that something timed out without having more specific information on what's going on is a very limited use. <clears throat> so in SDK3, we created the notion of an error context, which every SDK will dump alongside the timeout or error. And it will contain as much information as possible about what went wrong. So in the screenshot here, you can see a get request timed out. And then if we look at the error context um, that is uh, JSON alongside, so that's easier to parse as well, we can see that it got retried once. It, the reason that it failed was because of a timeout. We know that from the exception already. We know that we uh, talked to the travel sample bucket. We know that um, it used the default collection and we know the key. So airport 1277 is the document ID. And then if you look at the third line, we can see the retry reason why it got retried once was channel closed while in flight. Now, if you look at the documentation, you'll see that channel closed while in flight means that we dispatched the operation to the server, but then there's the connection got cut off in the middle. Because it's an item potent operation, we, the client retried it once, but it didn't return in time. So the request timed out. 
Just by looking at this information here, we know that uh, the socket got closed, we retried the operation, it was, it's a get operation, um, etc. Right? And we are always thinking about enhancing this error context further, adding more uh, service specific information. So for example, if you see the error context for a nickel query, it would include the statement. Now, let's take some time to talk about the general concerns you want to consider when moving from SDK 2 to 3. Let's, uh, let's do a little digression here. I want to briefly touch on API encapsulation because I think this is very important. Based on um, our experience that we see when working with the field, looking at user applications, is that if you can, you really want to make sure to encapsulate your database access as much as possible. So, you should avoid scattering database access throughout the code base to reduce coupling. And on the one hand, while it will make it easier to migrate to SDK3 because you only need to touch a handful of files, in my experience, it will also make it much easier to maintain your application in general. Because usually when you change something that regards database access, um, like error handling and propagation, caching, configuration changes, you only need to touch a handful of files versus going through hundreds of them. If, you, if you've done that, that's great. If you do that, we recommend refactoring probably before you migrate to SDK3 so that the, 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 the things you need to change and touch are more centralized, which will reduce the possibility that introduce regressions and bugs. Every SDK ships with a migration guide other than Scala and Ruby, which don't have SDK2 equivalents. But for Java, .NET, Golang, Python, PHP, and Node, we ship migration guides. And I include the links here for completeness, but the easiest is you just pick your favorite language, you go to the Couchbase documentation, and then in the navigation, you look for references, and then you'll find the migration guide in there. The migration guide is very specific in things that have changed. If you're missing something, um, please, contact us through support, open a ticket, so that if you have questions, we can help you and figure out what, maybe there were very specific things that, that you have questions about. So what has changed in the bootstrap process? We briefly touched on, you call connect and you open a bucket, etc. But the biggest difference is that bootstrap is now asynchronous in SDK3. In SDK2, when you call open bucket in your cluster, it would wait until it bootstrapped and then it will return control back to the application, then you perform an operation. In SDK3, we changed it very intentionally because usually we found that every failure you can get during bootstrap, you can also get when you perform an operation. A very classic one is wrong credentials. Right? Of course, you usually hit it when you bootstrap and then your credentials are wrong and then you can't make progress. But it's also possible that while the application is running, someone goes in and changes the credentials accidentally. And then suddenly your next, let's say nickel query doesn't work anymore, right? So you have to end up handling those exceptions anyways at the operation level. So we decided, okay, let's make all our operations like cluster bucket, uh, bucket default collection return instantaneously will bootstrap in the background, and then you just handle errors at the operation level. Now that's, that's all fine and dandy if, if, if you are starting, let's say a server, right? When the server bootstraps, and then once your first request comes in, usually everything is already bootstrapped. But if you have a slow network, it might take a little longer to completely bootstrap. And then your operation, your initial operation, if you do one, uh, like you see on the screen here, the collection get is pretty much performed immediately it might time out, right? Because Bootstrap hasn't completed yet. So if you have that use case and you want to wait until Bootstrap is complete, we added a method called wait until ready. And wait until ready is available both at the cluster and at the bucket level. And you can call it with a duration that a maximum number of seconds, of, yeah, usually seconds you want to wait until it times out and then it tells you we can't Bootstrap in time. What this will do is it will make sure that either the cluster or at the bucket level, it is fully bootstrapped, so then when the next operation you perform, immediately succeeds. 
So by default, we'll go down the route of saying it's asynchronous. Usually that's what, what you want. But if you have the use case where you want to make operations immediately afterwards, and you have maybe have slower networks or use very tight timeouts, usually you want to add wait until ready to make sure everything is bootstrapped and fine so that the, the operation goes through immediately. Another thing that's important to consider when migrating is that we remove the concept of a document. So in STQ2, we had JSON document, uh, binary document, etc. And it was a little confusing for some users. So it worked well as a concept, but we thought we could go one step further in terms of clarity. So we removed the concept of a document. We now have the document ID and the content when you write data independently. And transcoders and serializers can be configured either globally or through for every request for every option, which will make it much easier to, let's say, plug in a custom transcoder that stores protobuf data, or you're using a custom JSON serializer that, uh, for example, doesn't encode and decode the JSON data at all, but rather runs it through um, as raw bytes. I'm not going to go into much more detail here because this is an introductory session and transcoders and serializers, especially if you implement custom ones, are a little more advanced, but we have the information in our documentation. Please check it out for the language of choice. I briefly touched on error handling with the error context, but I want to emphasize that we also unified the exception error types across the SDKs. So they all should have the same name now. And also importantly, most of the errors are now retried automatically. So the best effort retry strategy will retry as much errors as we can. And of course, you're free to override that strategy and, and have custom strategies that fail fast on certain exceptions. But out of the box, we really want to give you the best experience to handle as much errors are possible that are possible in the time of duration you give us. And we are also quite sophisticated about deciding when to retry which error. So if you think about the different states a request goes through in its lifetime, we first have the client dispatch state, which is before we send it on the network. Then we send it on the network, the server does something with it, and then we get a response. Now, both for client dispatch and response received, we have very tight control about the operation and about the side effects it caused on the server. So we can even, um, in most cases, retry non-idempotent operations. Now, when an operation fails because it's on the network, let's say the socket gets shut down, usually we can only retry idempotent operations because we don't know which side effect non-idempotent operations caused. But that is all shielded from you. We'll just try our best to handle it then only if we can't handle it, but the error is propagated uh, to you at the user level. To close out, let's talk about the language specifics. On the Java side, we kept the three-tier architecture that we had in SDK2. So we have a core layer that handles rebalance reconfiguration. And then on top of that core layer, uh, we put uh, the Java language binding, and now in addition, the Scala language binding, and we're working on Kotlin. And then Spark, uh, Elasticsearch Connector, Kafka Connector, Spring Data Integration, they are all built on top of our language bindings. One cool feature that we added to Java is called structured logging. So in SDK3, we don't log directly to a logger, but rather we send events to an event bus, which means that you can also consume this event bus and let's say root your uh, events to your own uh, logging, centralized logging system without having to round trip to the client storing it in a file and then you're passing the file again and then you're sending it to another system. So you can make very quick decisions based on those events uh, if you want to, but by default, we'll just hook up our default logger and we we'll log all our events. But the nice thing about it is they are structured in a very specific manner, which you'll see on the screen, which you see on the screen down here. So there is a namespace, there is a specific event and then there is always a context associated with each message, which again, we'll try to put as much information now in the logs as we can to correlate certain events. Um, and also we added uh, an option user context. So when you perform a request, you can give us a map of arbitrary data, which will also log alongside um, the uh, request-based 
events and they are stored in um, the MDC of, of, let's say, log4j, right? So they will be dumped with the logs accordingly. So very flexible mechanism you might want to check out. In uh, .NET, uh, .NET now requires uh, C Sharp 7.2 and later. And we also target uh, .NET standard 2.0 and we require framework for 6.2 and later. And we also improved our .NET core support. And very, very important from an API point of view, now the API is fully async. So we are embracing async await throughout the code base. So the full .NET SDK is based on top of async await. In Node.js, uh, we, as I mentioned very early on in, 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 in the session, because the ecosystem moved to uh, async await and promises as a first class concept, now the Node SDK 3 also supports async await natively. So in this example here, you can see the collection of query awaits, and then you can uh, stream your rows. And the cool thing about it is that you'll just work with your um, operations as it is synchronous, but in the background, it's actually asynchronous. And also we converted the option blocks to option blocks from overloads. In Go, um, Go, actually went through a significant uh, list of changes. So we moved to Go modules. Uh, we support the Go context for cancellation and timers optionally. We attach extra error information and it's in general simplify, uh, easier to use. So here's an example of the, the Go error context. So it is provided as part of the options for each operation. It is not a requirement to use it. So you can still use the, the global and uh, request timeouts with durations. But if you have your context, your cancellation context from an upper level, you can pass it down into the client and, and use that to cancel your operation. Also with error handling, previously we used uh, Sentinel values for all errors. They're easy to compare against, but you can't embed any extra information, which is a little bit of a problem with the error context. So now it's uh, externally exposed interfaces and the different services have different error types. I would recommend you to check out the documentation uh, on the uh, specifics here. In PHP, uh, the big theme, other than of course reworking the API and, and modifying it and mod modernizing it to use a hierarchy of exceptions, etc., is that we dropped support for PHP 5 and moved to PHP 7. Um, since the PHP ecosystem really moved to 7 and along, uh, 7 and 7 and later, we also followed suit um, and of course alongside had to break uh, certain APIs and, and, and modernize our own APIs here. In Python is now uh, fully batteries included so it automatically bundles and builds sleep couch base. We support Python wheel um, on Windows and we added um, Python um, type annotations and overloads based on uh, the PP484. Async IO support is implemented um, with uh, Python SDK 3 and Twisted and GeoN support are planned and being worked on. And we also support the options and uh, the keyword arguments. With that, uh, thank you very much for your attention.